So uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anya Aleman. I know everybody here seems they're all familiar faces. Michael, I think this might be your first time here at one of our Ascender events. Yeah, welcome, welcome. I hope to see you again. Um, this is Ascender, it's Pittsburgh's community for entrepreneurs. We offer educational programs, mentorship, expert coaching, business incubation, and also run an entrepreneur-focused co-working space near Bakery Square. So if you're around the area, please come see us. We have a lot of great things and programming uh, planned for this upcoming month. And uh, just uh, make sure that you spend maybe a couple more, um, five to 10 minutes to browse our website to, uh, to find out our next upcoming events, but also all of the things that we offer. We have a great library of resources uh, where you can learn on your own time as well. And, um, and also events just like today's events uh, that you can attend in person, um, live. Uh, let's see, happy September 1st, everybody. I can't believe it's September already. We have a lot of great programming scheduled for this month. Uh, our next event is going to be Quick Hacks, building a no-code e-commerce site. So if you are an entrepreneur who needs to brush up on their website or just figure out a little bit more about what are the best practices of content and also visuals that you must have for your e-commerce site, uh, we really highly encourage you to, to come to this event. Or if you know someone that you think will benefit from this event, just recommend this event to them. We're going to put some links in the chat box uh, so that you can sign up. Uh, and uh, this will be a great time right now for um, those entrepreneurs who are in retail or who have e-commerce platforms to really get ready right now before the holiday season. So that's why we are, um, we are planning ahead by having this event in September. We also have a lot of great things scheduled for in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. So stay tuned on those events and uh, just make sure that if you haven't already done so, sign up to our newsletter or just check out our website for more information. Um, so today's Real Talk with Founders is about leadership and you know how do you uh, do bold leadership and also see real results. And I am very excited to have our two speakers today. So um, just to get us started right now, I'm gonna hand it over to our Executive Director, Nadili Nunez, who will be introducing our speakers. Nadili, go ahead. Hi everyone, again, familiar faces and some new ones. Uh, as Anya mentioned, I'm Nadili Nunez, like really Nadili, I'm the executive director of Ascender and happy to be here with you all. So as usual, we're gonna have some real talk about leadership today. Uh, today we have some great, two great experts um, in that they've co-founded a, com you know, a company, they've been around for a while, they've grown their team, uh, they, they've gotten a lot of publicity. If you don't know them, well, you know, you're welcome, you will today. Uh, so, so they always do a better job introducing themselves, but I will start with Raji, who I've always been impressed with her from afar, uh, with her company that she co-founded, Wholesome International. They've actually created their own operation, which is Chula Delicious. It's actually near a sender. Uh, and they've also helped franchise Five Guys. And that's just two small things compared to her larger things that she's done. So I'll have her introduce herself first a little bit more. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, we are huge fans of Ascender as well at Wholesome. Uh, and especially my chief creative officer uh, in particular uh, is so thrilled that, you know, you're right around the corner from Chula, right? Um, I have, uh, I'm the co-CEO and co-founder of uh, Wholesome International. We started on this journey of food in 2003 when we wrote a business plan, what became Chula in 2014. Uh, and uh, we also franchise Five Guys. We have 25 units of Five Guys and six Chulas. Wow. All right, we'll pass it on. Thank you, Raji. Uh, we'll pass it on to Lou, who I've known since 2016, and I'm glad to have him on here. I've always tapped on his shoulder for different ways to help the entrepreneurs that we work with. Uh, I really appreciate Lou, because Lou's at every event. He's either... <laughs> you know, leading it, he's running a company, or he's passing the badges at registration. You know, there's there's no small job or too big of a job for Lou. So I appreciate all the work that he does here in Pittsburgh. So Lou, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Nadelia. So I appreciate being here. And, you know, I'm a big 
biggest Sender fan as well. So hi, everyone. I'm Lou Camerlengo. I'm the uh, CEO, president, and co-founder of Five Star. We are a custom software design development and implementation shop based here in Pittsburgh. My partner, Dave Clazy, and I started Five Star a little over uh, 24 years ago. Um, we are more of a boutique organization. We have under 30 people uh, on our team, and we work with a wide range of organizations across the United States doing all uh, custom development. Some of it kind of back-end work for our clients, um, but we also have a focus in workforce development, so working with organizations in the public workforce space and developing applications that help people with career exploration and development. Fabulous. All right. Well, thank you both again for coming. Uh, as for those who have been here before, you've heard me say this spiel, but as usual, you know, we try to ask all the questions or as many of the questions that you put in during registration. We received so many. Some of them I was like, okay, that's a really great <laughs> question. And so I'm excited to hear what but both Lou and Raji have to say about these. Uh, you know, I might interrupt in the middle of it just to kind of, you know, keep going and just just get as much value and information out there to the entrepreneurs here with us today and for those who will be tuning in for the recording or the medium blog after this. So uh, I know I think this week school started for some kids, so it's busy week for some people. And so um, I'm looking forward and, and maybe I'll pass on any additional questions that they that we might get afterward to both Lou and Raji, which we sometimes do. All right, so the speed round. This is a complete the sentence speed round. It's just to get that information out, get out of the way. And it's supposed to serve two things, all right? One is to understand the lens of each of you, where you're coming from. And so just some level setting. And then the other part is just to get some quick answers, particularly today about leadership uh, that, that I think doesn't require necessarily a long story, but of course we can always elaborate after the fact. But we've got tons of questions, but let's do the speed round, complete the sentence. And today I'm actually gonna copy and paste the first three kind of uh, questions here for you to answer and each of you can, can take turns. So one, I've been in leadership position, like, uh, sorry, I've been in a leadership position or leading my current organization for how many number of years? So for you, it's since the founding. Uh, my company currently employs X amount of employees and we reached 10 employees after X number of years of founding. So when you go, can you just answer all three? How about Lou, you go first. Sure, uh, it's been uh, 24 years since we started uh, Five Star. Uh, right now we have 27, soon to have 28 um, employees. And we probably reached the 10 employee mark at the end of year two, maybe into year three. Wow, nice. What about you, Raji? And are you speaking from uh, Wholesome International or from Chula? So I'll speak for Wholesome International. Um, Wholesome International, we've been, I've been in a leadership position uh, for 17 years uh, now. Uh, and my company has over 750 employees. Uh, and we reached um, the 10, 10 mark uh, in the very first um, restaurant opening because restaurants need a lot of people, as you know. Absolutely. What about in the administrative level? So the administrative level, we reached uh, that in about three years. Three years. Okay. So the next complete the sentence is, if I had to describe my leadership style or mantra in three words, they would be, Raji, how about you go first? All right. Uh, would be co-create um, and uh, share wealth. Share wealth. Okay. Nice. Lou, what about you? Yeah. For us, it's a built to evolve. Build to evolve. All right, nice. I like that. All right, so these are two of the similar questions, but they're in two different time, you know, times in your life. So one, at the start of my career, I attributed my leadership growth mostly to A, formal training, B, self-taught books, videos, C, mentors, or D, instinct, trial and error. Lou, how about you go first? Sure. Uh, so pretty much started uh, instinct trial and error. So we realized that wasn't working too well. And then we focused mostly with, uh, uh, at that point, with mentors. Okay. You said with mentors? Yes. Cool. All right. Mentors. What about you, Raji? 
mentors. Uh, still have a lot of mentors. Started my journey with mentors. Um, a huge uh, role in my life. Mm -hmm. They they make a huge difference, truly. Uh, all right, well, same question, and that's as it relates to today. What do you attribute, attribute your most recent leadership growth to? Same options. I'm staying with mentors uh, because as we grow, we discover new areas we need to evolve in, and so that becomes uh, a never-ending piece. Absolutely. Lou? Yeah, I would agree with that, though. I am actually taking a little bit more of a formalized program now, but it, it is predominantly uh, through mentors, both uh, informal and formal type of mentoring, things like, you know, executive coaches and different programs. But a lot of it is just tapping into people that we know that are experts in particular areas. How I'm, I'm steering away real quickly because because uh, I get this question a lot. How do you find an informal mentor? How do you rope them in to invest in, you know, invest their time in you? Uh, I, I think a lot of it, there's, um, there's definitely some kind of uh, give and take in that relationship. I mean, it's, it's, I don't think it's ever totally one sided, but a lot of it is just through personal relationships. I mean, that's, I think, one of the advantages of being kind of out and about quite a bit. I mean, there's just so many people, even particularly in Pittsburgh, that um, have a lot of expertise in a lot of areas, and they're all pretty accessible. So I, I think if, if, you know, at least from my standpoint, I find if I kind of put some of my time in supporting organizations, people are really kind of happy to help um, when you need support yourself. Especially in Pittsburgh. Especially in Pittsburgh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so the next to complete your sentences, is uh, one major thing I needed to change or learn as a leader was. And then the second part is I am still working on. So before, when you started as a leader, what was one thing you definitely needed to change and you've changed since then? And then the second part is what's something as a leader you're still working on? So for me, uh, it was about um, the sense that I have all the answers. <laughs> And as an entrepreneur, you tend to have a very strong vision and that is essentially what guides you. But um, learning that, uh, you know, together a recipe is much more fun than a single ingredient recipe um, is a powerful learning. And I'm still working on me. I am my biggest limitation uh, is what I have learned. Mm, that's, I feel you on that last part for sure. <laughs> what about you, Lou? Uh, I think for me, it was, um, providing more kind of consistent, actionable feedback to the people on the team uh, was one of the things that kind of bubbled up initially. You know, people were very much kind of wanting more ongoing communication feedback. Um, so that's definitely an area that um, I worked on. Now I'm focusing more on uh, kind of the racial diversity aspect of the company. I, I think we've always been a pretty balanced organization. And, and we've always, I think, been particularly balanced in gender, but racial diversity has always been a little bit of a um, missed area of ours. So I'm, I'm starting, that's kind of where the primary focus is, is right now. Fabulous. And, and we have a whole section of today's talk to talk about that. Yeah, it's cool uh, to see that. So that's, that's pretty awesome. All right, so the next two, and we're almost done here, for the speed round is one, what's the most dangerous trait of a leader that you've seen in either yourself or in someone else without mentioning any names? Uh, <laughs> I, I like the little, the yeah. little chuckle. <laughs> no, no names. I, I, I actually think um, it's, it's kind of hubris. I, I, I think it's, you know, thinking ultimately that as the leader, you are kind of the be all or end all of everything and that it's fundamentally about you. Mm. Raji? I agree with that and uh, ego is what came to mind and uh, everyone has ego, being able to keep it in check is uh, so critical, um, especially uh, when you're working with a team because how do you align them or create harmony if you are in the picture? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, ego, I 100% agree in those moments, you sometimes 
don't always self-diagnose or self-realize. And so can one of you tell me of a time where you had to self-check your ego, big or small? Actually, lots of times, <laughs> even as- <laughs> can, you, can you pick one to share? Um, and uh, as an example, it is like when I'm very sure, certain that something is the right way, then being able to um, you know, be shown a completely different way, right? Of uh, how things really are, right? The ground truth is completely different and uh, um, it can make you, uh, it, it takes you back. It actually uh, makes you think uh, twice. So it happens whether it could be as simple as maybe an idea uh, that I might be very convinced is the right way to do. Uh, and uh, I have been proven wrong um, to having a conversation that may not go the exact way uh, that it uh, needed to go because of an approach that uh, somebody has taught me. I, I have uh, teachers everywhere, including from our front lines um, to our team members. So uh, pretty much every day, um, to be very honest, I am coached. That's amazing. That's great. Uh, Lou, you wanted to share one? Yeah, sure I can. And it's actually, I think it's somewhat related even to a lesson learned. Um, you know, the company was growing pretty steadily um, for like the first 10 years. Um, so we really thought we had it kind of all together um, and uh, just wound up bringing on kind of a lot of people and moving into a new office. And that was in 2008. And that was the year that, you know, the recession hit. And, you know, within a year, it was kind of a completely different scenario. So I, I think we, you know, we had a coach once that used to talk about it, it's good to be in front of the headlights, but not too far in front of the headlights. And I think we just were a little bit kind of, you know, I think it was just full of myself at that point, thinking that, you know, this is just, you know, nothing is really going to be kind of an obstacle. And then, you know, we hit a pretty significant obstacle and it definitely took a while for us to kind of bounce back from that. Yeah, and then you went on to win, you know, a bunch of awards after, mm -hmm. like best places to work and, you know, top companies in the nation. So, you know, <laughs> you recovered. It's, it's easier to grow when you're small. It's true. <laughs> That's true. Okay. My last speed round question is, a. Uh, oh, let me paste it here too. What are some HR benefits, payroll, or employee performance software programs you use? or the end that you would recommend? So it's a, a kind of a interesting situation. We have a lot of different things that we piece together. We don't have a single uh, one complete method. We have uh, Paylocity that we use for our HR uh, MS. We use our own homegrown uh, software tools that we have created uh, for that. Um, and we're constantly benchmarking uh, on what else could be used, right? And uh, we have learned of awesome survey tools um, that uh, people have used like Motley Fools. I had just recently done a benchmark with them and they do um, quarterly surveys. And so I'm gonna look at implementing that uh, in our world. Uh, and uh, so it's a, we, we have done 360 degree surveys um, for team members to be able to give feedback upwards, downwards, uh, and sideways. Um, so an appreciation system, that's my favorite part of them all, like recognition, appreciation system. I, I really love hearing that because on your website, especially for people who are interested in, in employment, you talk about, you know, you want to hear people's ideas. And I think a lot of companies say that, but when yes. that happens, not really, you know, and so to hear that you actually have systems and platforms in place to do that it's not just going to someone's office it's just you you are actively saying we want to hear from you not like our door is open so that's that's wonderful Lou what about you I'm sure you build all of it customized <laughs> no, don't build what's already working um we the primary tool we use for most of kind of the uh people related functions is a cool is a tool called centric HR, um, and we do our payroll through that. Uh, we do all our performance management planning. Uh, we can do 360s through that um, as well. Uh, and, and again, being a small organization, it's actually set up pretty well. So, I mean, it, it, it really suits our needs. And then externally, um, there is a, an organization in Ann Arbor called Denison Consulting. 
And they have a phenomenal uh, cultural assessment and 360 tool. Um, and without getting into too much detail, what's nice about it, it's all based in research. So they've been doing it long enough that they can demonstrate how organizations that um, plot on their surveys actually perform in the marketplace. So basically the higher you are rating, the closer you are benchmarking to other highly performing organizations. And that is predominantly based on financial metrics. I mean, companies that are doing well, uh, kind of in, not just financially, but companies that are performing really well. So, you know, we, we will do those occasionally. Um, you know, we don't do them every year, but um, we do them pretty regularly. So it gives us indications of what's kind of going on in the company that's working well and what's not. And it also gives people the ability to do kind of individualized feedback, which comes in an anonymous way. And that's also, I mean, you mentioned like the best places to work and things. I mean, part of the reasons we do those is, is because they are benchmark surveys. So, you know, it does give us, uh, mm -hmm. particularly the state level one, that's a much more kind of comprehensive survey than the local one. So it's not bad to get that level of feedback. So we get a lot of data um, and we don't always obviously make it um, every year. So it's almost more helpful on the years that we don't make it than the years that we do, because it just helps us, you know, understand what's really going on, no matter how much we kind of interact with people. I mean, it's always good to give people the ability to just give you feedback in a way that's helpful, but non-identifiable if they feel like that's important. But, you know, most people I think feel comfortable sharing, but those types of things I think are really invaluable. I really like the idea of using these kinds of recognition or nominations, not necessarily for the award, but rather to see where you stand amongst that standard. Are there questions you're not asking yourself as a company? That makes a lot of sense to me. Because I say the same thing with when it comes to pitch competitions. Like these are questions about your business they're asking you that you should know the answer to anyway. So regardless if you get in or not, you should do that as an exercise. So this is really smart to do it for, for as your team culture and your leadership being that I love that idea. Uh, it's good to win too. I mean, I mean, <laughs> but that, that's also a big kind of recruiting thing we mm -hmm. have found. Like I'm, I'm always surprised that people say, hey, I noticed that, you know, you were best place to work and that was definitely an indicator. So again, there's, there's, you know, there's that aspect of it is also super helpful, particularly these days when it is super competitive right now. Yes, people very, across very. the spectrum. Yeah, very. I can't imagine what it's like for Raji to have 750 people and managing that level of culture. I mean, it, it's a completely different, obviously, scale than what we deal with. Uh, absolutely. And and speaking of recruiting and, and finding the funnel of people, where do you go to find those people? Either platforms, pe you know, other individuals, what do you do? So referrals is our biggest, um, you know, thing. And so we actually um, increased or enhanced our referral bonuses um, and uh, reduced the time frame, right, in which the referral bonuses are um, given uh, to the people. So in fact, we're in the process of overhauling that uh, to see if we could get on multiple levels because it has been very successful in the tier of uh, frontline team members. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we obviously, uh, you know, headhunters or um, recruiters are definitely, we have partners since 2006 that have been very good to us and understand our culture. Um, but I think referrals has been our biggest, biggest thing. And then uh, on top of it, I guess retention goes hand in hand, right? Recruiting doesn't really work if you're just filling a funnel and then out goes the group. So uh, retention program became a big focus for us um, this year. Um, and how could we show our appreciation to our team members uh, in multiple ways? We also use this uh, traditional LinkedIn. We actually just deployed an AI-based um, uh, tool. Uh, she is sitting on Chula at the moment. We'll be getting on our Five Guys world uh, very soon. But the idea is being able to take an application in uh, less than a couple of minutes and being able to schedule interviews uh, for our team. What Lou said, with the number of people that we have, we do need that capacity uh, and can't have bottlenecks. Uh, so we are using Paradox 
Uh, and so if you go on our website, you'll see Sophia in action. So whether it's midnight or 4 a.m., it was really cool to see applicants come in uh, and uh, it's a chat. That's how the application happens, no forms. That's that's amazing. And, and I think it also, you know, we have to look into where did the whole resume or the current typical process come from and who built that and is it inclusive to other people you know in the future is can you verbalize your resume some people are more verbal processors so I think that's very and AI is going to be a, a really great place for that um, so so that's wonderful and you talked about the um, retention program can you say a little bit more about that what does that look like so um, uh, you know how can we recognize service anniversaries is a very common thing but now in our new world we actually do these zoom based contests uh, so we had a uh, pumpkin uh, carving contest in November after uh, you know after the effect right and then we did a float parade contest so people would take a shoebox size thing stores compete online and this is the entire company so we're doing two of those every year so it'll be a lot of fun we do celebrate everything we celebrate uh store openings we celebrate uh uh you know anniversaries we send cupcakes we send cookies um edible arrangements you name it what could we do to create that and uh, that's the kind of stuff that People remember, right? We're actually in the process of planning and online cooking together. Uh, and uh, so that'll get with family. So you do something in lieu of picnics, which we are not able to do, and right? Given the circumstances and how do we stay COVID friendly? So those are some of the things. And and that's that's wonderful in retention, but also for people who are aspiring, because they I believe that you very much hire internally as you are looking for higher leadership. And even on the beginning for the frontliners, you pay on a weekly basis. So you kind of get that feedback loop as a worker in the front line, uh, yeah. or on the line, I should say, uh, of of compensation from for the work that you just did. Perfect. And how could we also like we also put in uh, daily pay now so people can actually oh, draw against yeah. their weekly uh, pay. Uh, so how could we make it easy? Right. It all comes down to convenience and ease and uh, a place of work schedules. I yeah, think you have yeah, to. very flexible work schedules. It does. And we also have a college management training program. We have an internship program where they can get credits. Um, so what could we do that would be more value add just like we do for customers? That's wonderful. And and uh, Lou, for Five Star, I know you have Five Star Cares and volunteering is very central to, to what you do. I see that in you all the time, volunteering, mm -hmm. but you have volunteer days, but you also have a lot of volunteer events as a team. So tell me more about that. Yeah, so um, just super high level uh, uh, for to bringing people into the organization. Referrals is definitely um, part of what we do. People, you know, referring people that they work with, that they like to work with. Um, again, I mean, there's a little bit of a risk there because if somebody does leave for some reason they often like to work with those people again so that does happen on occasion um, and then for technical positions now we are dealing primarily with recruiters because that's really the only way i mean it's just so competitive and then the other positions we do a combination of things like indeed and and even like things like craigslist and from a retention standpoint um, we do find that the Five Star Cares program, which is the, you know, the volunteer program definitely is a factor. I mean, everybody, you know, most people really want to get involved, but don't really sometimes know how. So we provide opportunities for them to do that through the company, um, you know, as group activities, individual, and then people also have the ability to um, do things. Um, we give everybody at least like a day a year um, if they want to do their own um, opportunities. Um, you know, I think, you know, our philosophy has always been if we can provide interesting and challenging work in an environment that fosters professional development and, and really give people true work life balance, which we really try to do. We never structured the company so that people would have to work kind of an enormous amount of hours on a consistent basis. I mean, that certainly does happen at times, but it is a pretty regular um, schedule. So, I mean, a lot of it is understanding what people are looking for in the experience and where they're looking to go so that we can kind of help them uh, with that as well, knowing that, you know, we literally have our first employee, Corey, has been with us for 24 years and we've had people across the entire spectrum. So we know some people are going to 
be there for a few years because it's kind of a part of the journey. Some people are are potentially it could be the last of their journey or somewhere in between. So kind of understanding where they are, where they want to go, how does that mesh with where we are, where we want to go, helping them kind of doing that is part of it. Um, and I think it's also, you know, one of the advantages of being kind of boutique is that you do really know everybody. I mean, at a pretty deep level, um, you know, there's a, uh, there's a program out uh, in Johnstown uh, called Outdoor Odyssey, which is run by a former Marine General, General Jones, and it's a youth development program and a, and a, a wounded warriors program. And he's phenomenal. And he talks about genuine concern, which is, you know, I, I think people want to understand that you know kind of what motivates them and what's important to them and, and how you can support that. So we really, you know, that's really important for anybody that's kind of a leader in the company. So I think everybody does feel that they have a pretty individualized um, experience, um, uh, which is definitely a big um, plus when people are knocking on the door because people are knocking on the door all the time. I mean, I, I just know it, right? I mean, it's just, you know, you have good people, people are in demand. I mean, I know our people are getting inquiries, you know, all the time. So, um, you know, I think having them know that we do kind of think about them at that level, I think is important to them. And then, and I'm hearing from you uh, that not only while they're at your company, but even at the beginning, because your interview process includes uh, behavioral interviewing as mm -hmm. well. So sometimes it's just not a fit for whatever reason or what right. they, they desire for their career. And so you, when did you implement, how many years into your company did you implement behavioral interviewing? Yeah, and can that's you give a an example of a question? Sure, sure. And that, that's a really good question. And that's actually even a good example of mentors because we were probably in business about a year and a half two years and we were starting to hire more people and one of our clients our first client in pittsburgh was ppg um, and our client was in human resources um, so he actually helped us implement that system of behavioral interviewing like we were talking to him about you know the fact that we we're starting to hire people and we it was a completely new concept so he actually helped us kind of set up that process and the whole concept behind behavioral interview is that having people relate experiences that are similar to what they would experience or be expected to do in the company so that we can kind of understand um, what those are and they can also get a good understanding of what the culture of the company is like and there's a little bit of debate about that to a degree in terms of it being homogeneous at times, but I think if you pay attention to it. So, you know, an example is, you know, uh, tell me about a time that you were in a situation of conflict with someone on your team. You know, what was that situation? What caused it? And how did, how was that situation resolved to everybody's satisfaction? Um, you know, because people can talk in generalities a lot but when you really start, you know, having them talk about, you know, an would, yeah, an example, you know, not as, mm -hmm. as, you know, anonymized as it has to be, but when I was with this company in this situation and this happened, and that's what behavioral interview is. So we have questions for each aspect of the different roles, both from a kind of a competency standpoint, as well as kind of a behavioral and cultural standpoint. And answering a question like that is is far more informative than saying, are you a team player? You know right. what I mean? Or, I'm a team or can you resolve conflict? That doesn't tell you as much. Yeah. I mean, think about all the motivational speeches we've seen or viewed and you're like, yes, you know, in theory, you know what's right. But in practice, that's a lot harder. Uh, and so answering a question like that in the way that you described it, Lou, is great. And I'm actually going to link at the end of this, I actually listened to some of your, your podcast with Aaron Watson uh, right. a couple of yeah. years back, mm -hmm. and you did refer a little bit to this um, and just kind of how do you build a company that evolves? So what was right at the beginning doesn't mean it's always right after, you know, later on. So um, Raji, I had a question. I actually looked at a, um, 
there was a video of you in 2018. <laughs> I hope this doesn't come off as creepy, but there's a video in 2018. It was the PAL Sudden Service it, I'm yes. sure it was a conference, but you mentioned something that was very interesting. And I think it can be hard for an entrepreneur where you talked about a managing partner who would rather be short on staff and maintain standards than to tolerate mediocrity with more employees. And so can you tell me about how do you make that decision that how tough that can be? You know, it's actually uh, now is a great time, right? These days, it's uh, even more predominant than uh, back in 2018 uh, with these pressures that people have on uh, getting the right people. Uh, so one of the things that we had decided was, and we learned it the hard way, when you have 10 people and it's like trying to get them all, they are half people really because they are not uh, aligned with the mission and they are not working towards the thing. You have to constantly chase them and figure out what they are doing instead of being able to focus on serving the customer. So we learned very early on through some really hard times that, hey, this is not a good place. If you get everyone who is uh, committed to our mission, vision, and values, life is a lot easier. So we have had um, scenarios where people have chosen our managing partners, even in today's world, if there is a shift that is with fewer people, you're actually rising to the occasion, right? Everyone puts in their 200%. And that is worth so much more than trying to get uh, someone who is half there. Uh, and uh, it's not easy to say because it can get old if you keep doing that day after day after day after day. Obviously, it has to be paired with uh, being able to find the people, but that has been a real experience for us of having really crappy shifts to having great shifts with just a few people and feeling of victory. That's that's a really good point. And, and you're right, it is very tough because sometimes you're trying to figure out what can what can you teach and what can you not teach and what do you have the time to have patience for? Because sometimes yes. certain people arrive, you just see like the possibility and the potential, but you're just so overwhelmed, you need someone a little bit more prepared already and there are other times where we'll take you under the wing you have the fun we'll teach component. you yeah How absolutely. Do you, especially if it's a, you're not a leader for 20 for 17 or 24 years if you're a first time you know founder and you're early probably like some of the people on this call how do you even notice that? How do you, because hiring is expensive, firing is even more expensive and having to fill that role. So, you know, frameworks are very helpful, right, in life in general. So uh, we adopted the Malcolm Baldrige framework, which is what you refer to as PALS. And the Malcolm Baldrige framework basically takes end to end uh, from strategy of the company to all the way to results, uh, which matter at the end of the day, you, if you're not around. Uh, to serve people, it doesn't matter what business idea you had. Uh, so you have to have a very healthy uh, existence. So we applied that and there is so many resources, state resources and uh, resources in the form of PALS, which is now called uh, McCluskey Excellence Institute uh, that allow you to do that. We've also uh, taken scaling up uh, as a framework uh, for certain pieces that has been very helpful to us. There's actually a book called Scaling Up. And we have taken, when COVID uh, hit, uh, we were at a standstill. We didn't know what to do. And uh, um, one of our mentors taught us, run to the middle of the fire, right? That is literally one of our mantras, run to the middle of the fire. And uh, what we did was the entire senior leadership team took a scaling up course for crisis edition. It's psychology is everything. 80% of uh, what you do is psychology uh, is often said. And that's what we work on is how can we create the psychology so that the mindset is about um, the future, about what we need to create, not being stuck wherever we are. And if that means the wrong person is in the bus, that's something we need to acknowledge and figure out where uh, we made mistakes. And we have done many of those mistakes through our journey. And I think we're getting better. Uh, in that process. Nice, nice. Lou, anything to add there? I have, a next, I have a question for you. Yeah, not, not that, I mean, I think that's pretty pretty comprehensive. I mean, you mentioned uh, right person on the bus. So I, I'm assuming you've read kind of good to great, which is one of the, uh, that was actually one of the foundational books that we used um, uh, pretty early into the company. And there is a lot in that, um, practice that I think really still applies today. Fabulous. Now, in what Raji was saying and scaling up and, and that vision, I think it takes a combination of both leadership and management, which I actually don't think are the same thing, but they're very aligned, but you need both. And so how would you define leadership versus management, Lou? Um, so uh, first off, um, 
the the leadership is not tied to a title. I mean, just in terms of so I'll define it just a little bit differently. But I mean, the the concept is leaders on all levels, right? So which is kind of empowering people to be able to make decisions that um, help them. Um, so, but there is definitely a, a difference, I think, in kind of function. So the way we look at it is that um, each of our departments has a working manager. Um, they are also a leader, but from a management perspective, they are really close to the ground in the work that's happening in their department. So, I mean, the ultimate responsibility is to make sure that people have what they need and have the capabilities required to pretty much get things done because we are a custom shop. It's all based on billable hours. I mean, we make money when we meet or exceed our targets and we lose money if we do not do that. So the managers really, their responsibility is making sure that their teams have what they need to be able to fire on all cylinders and to identify people that can take increased responsibilities. I mean, from a leadership perspective, um, it, it, you know, I think it's that on the management level, but it's also, you know, being more active, obviously, in setting the strategy, you know, engagement. I mean, I think the leader's primary responsibility is, is living the culture and demonstrating that pretty much on um, a regular basis. That's, that's a fabulous distinction, and you're right. Leadership doesn't necessarily have to be the CEO position, the president position. You're absolutely right. And and curious, you know, when for Raji, when you're hiring, uh, and maybe you're not as involved firsthand, so either of you can answer this, how can you determine or can you see that at the interview level when you're interviewing someone, potential leadership capability, even if their position is just like frontline or the beginning, that they can grow into the company? How do you notice that from the beginning? I have a great story of uh, a, um, it was 2008. Uh, it was our fifth Five Guys. Uh, we were very much in the stores. We were actually the managers, general managers in our stores. And I remember meeting the 16-year-old. Uh, she was our very first hire in the store. She came in and she's a rock star. Um, you can feel in her uh, in a involvement with friends and clubs. And uh, she said, I'm going to be an iron chef, right? She's still with us today. Uh, she's our head training manager and uh, uh, just went on to win Five Guys Olympics, won $50,000. And wow. she was one of our strongest leaders, went and had a baby, came back now at Chula. And so, um, you know, you just could see that, like, you know, they uh, exude um, that uh, quality of, okay, I care. I, um, you know, there are people in my lives that I serve. It doesn't have, you have, you're a 16 year old, but the difference that she made for her family, for her pets, uh, for her church, uh, and the fact that there was uh, this conviction that, you know, she's going to make the world uh, somebody, something way different than what she has seen in the past and what she can do. And that, uh, that was just uh, true. Even today, she's one of our best leaders. Wow, that's that is an incredible story. You're right. <laughs> that's wonderful. Lou, how, how do you distinguish it? Now, you know, you are working with them close, it's a small team. How do you distinguish if someone has that leadership capability? Yeah, so um from kind of a recruiting standpoint, um again, some people come in with a level of experience already, but I mean, we do hire people that are relatively new in their career. So some of the things that we look for as part of that process is even kind of like on a high school or college level where they um, involved with something that they were a leader where they were elected by their peers. In other words, that other people had kind of recognized them as people that had qualities for leadership. Um, you know, once people get in the company, because, you know, again, it is pretty compact. I mean, you can see um, you know, quickly who has, um, you know, people talk about natural born leaders, and I think that's true kind of to a degree. There are certain traits, but I think you can also teach people how to be leaders. But it's really like you see people who who see someone is struggling with something, somebody, and they just start helping them, right? Or they're they're always kind of raising their hands to say, hey, I'm a little bit ahead. Is there anything else that somebody needs help with? Um, you know, they're coming to us with, 
hey, you know, I was thinking about something. I saw the way we're doing it. Uh, you know, we really thought about doing it this way instead of that way. So, you know, that they're kind of thinking about how to make things better and how to make other people better is typically what, you know, for us are key indicators. And even though we're small, we can offer people the ability for being kind of a project lead and then maybe a team lead. And again, all of our, except one, um, management people have come from within the company and not all of them had um, formal kind of management um, experience as part of that. So there is some ability. Um, and for us, when people leave that, that's typically one of the reasons. In other words, they're looking to be involved in an organization where there's just more room for that level of growth, which again, we can offer things, but there it is kind of finite just based on our size. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. And, and you answered one of the questions I was going to ask, which was, is leadership capability enabled? So someone has it in them, they just need to have it enabled through teaching, mentoring, whatever, or uh, uh, is it essentially innate or, or nature like can it be taught or is it innate and need to, needs to be enabled and what I hear you saying is that it, it can be both you know some people kind of just naturally have some inclinations and others as long as their desires of it can be leaders and it does it could be at different capacities whether you said team lead it's a project lead it's just the expert in the room for a certain topic mm -hmm. um so so that makes a lot of sense and man that made me think what was my other question it was about leadership but oh, from professional development from either side of you, how do you incorporate professional development within your team? Is it courses in-house that you have, modules? Do you send them somewhere? What do you offer? So for us, we used to send people to Texas, Austin, Texas, uh, for the two Baldridge winners in the restaurant world uh, was one was uh, Rudy, Rudy's Barbecue and Mighty Fine Burgers in Texas, and then you had Pal's Sudden Service, right? Uh, and we used to send everyone, now we do them virtually, um, because they do have virtual um, options. And in a way, it works out great because we can send more people. Uh, more frequently. So that has been a great organizational uh, development element for us. And we also work very heavily on personal um, uh, development, taking the blind spots out. How could we do that? So we invest in a lot of education on that front too. Great. Um, yeah. yeah, on our side, um, it is a combination as well. I mean, you know, one thing about being more technical, I mean, there are certifications and things. So, you know, we support and sponsor people that are looking for different technical certifications. I mean, we just had somebody that completed their, you know, the, the PMP for project management. So, um, you know, we, we, you know, pay for those things. We help them with training. We, you know, give them time to kind of work on that stuff, um, that type of stuff. And then um, we also talk about kind of workflow learning. So we can introduce things into the work, you know, learning a new tool, learning a new capability. And that's even kind of gets to some of the leadership aspects. You know, we can help people develop leadership skills by giving them more responsibility in a, in a, a project and supporting that as well. So it's a combination of, you know, kind of formalized training, which is mostly on the technical side and then, um, you know, kind of in-house training, which is typically more on those, you know, the competency side. That makes a lot of sense for some of these companies, whether big or small, you know, these kinds of things cost money. So how do you determine what to budget and how in advance, you know, for this year, for the upcoming year, we budget this amount and that's and from an ad hoc perspective, we'll distribute. How do you determine that budget by employee, by department? For us, it's investment by person. Uh, it's hard to create a budget, uh, and uh, the danger is what if you don't uh, invest, right? Uh, and then you haven't really realized the full potential. Um, so for us, it's always been by person. Great. Yeah, we um, and it's somewhat arbitrary and and not cast in stone. But you know, at one point we just started, hey, everybody gets two thousand dollars a year for professional development, and that was kind of way back when, when that was mostly conferences and that's kind of what it costs to go to a decent uh, conference. So there's a little bit of just like, uh, that's still a little bit part of the lexicon, but it's definitely more, I think, in terms of how 
Praja is articulating it, which is what does, where does somebody really want to go? What do they need and how do we get them there? And I don't think people are particularly hopped up if it's, you know, $300 or, you know, $5,000. I mean, it, it's really based on what they're hoping to gain from it. And um, there's a lot of things that can be done that would not necessarily be particularly um, cost intensive to do those things. Okay. Uh, so one, two questions that we received that are, and I know we're running out of time and I have so many more I want to mm -hmm. ask, but uh, but question that we received, especially when you're hiring your first employee or you're just starting to grow your company, you know, you, you kind of get concerned, well, okay, if I give them a salary or a pay, what if they don't work out? What have, did you do any kind of temporary contract or limited contract for potential of employment? How did you, if you remember when you were first starting your company, how did you start with those first few employees? We actually hired salaried uh, team members because we needed to build an organization, right? Uh, and uh, we were green <laughs> and we didn't know what uh, we were doing and it showed. Uh, so <laughs> it kind of was one of those big lessons of, hey, um, you know, you can't just uh, sit in behind a desk and hope culture happens, right? You need to get into it and you need to build it. So we uh, learned that and out of that came the sense of who is a good fit for us, but then we didn't know where we were marching towards. So we created our mission, vision and values. And then out of that, now everything is aligned with that. The questions, the interviews, we adopted top grading as our uh, approach. Um, and so historical uh, experiences, plus we do day in the life where people actually come and experience what we are like so that they can uh, decide, is this for me or not? And likewise for us to know, is this person going to be uh, in sync uh, with the rest? And um, we have to be able to contribute to that person as much as they have to contribute to the organization. So both sides are very critical to us. And that's one of the ways we uh, evolved. Hmm. But that's interesting. I like that. And Lou, I might ask you a different question just in the interest mm -hmm. of time, but related, you know, can you tell me of a time where you were, you had an employee and it just wasn't working? And as a leader, as, I should say, as a manager, you're trying to figure out, well, is it because it's not a good fit or I need to change my leadership style or I need to help in a different way? And so tell me of a time where you had to distinguish between that and either you had to let them go or they ended up excelling. Yeah. Um, so kind of the way we look at it is that if someone is exited from five star unless there was something that was just egregious that happened which literally only happened once i mean we had somebody that was it was just a complete kind of violation of company values and it was like on the spot but like that was a very rare type of thing so we basically what we talk about is or at least what i feel is that when someone is exited from the company, it is typically a shock, but it's never a surprise, which means if we are sensing that someone is not, that there is an issue there, we start pretty early in the process. I mean, everybody has biweekly one-on-ones, you know, with their managers so that things can be identified and there's a pretty long window. And I would say on average, that's about two months from when something is identified till you get to the point where it's like you've pretty much tried everything um, and not not getting them um, to fit. So to answer kind of your particular question, um, this, um, you know, we, you know, we did have a person that we were having challenges with. Um, and a lot of it was just being able to get there, right? I mean, just really good really smart but like like you just never knew when they were going to show up um and what we realized is that you know we're like well how about start at 10 o'clock right can you come you know this was in the old days right um you know can you commit to 10 o'clock and it's like i think i can commit to 10 o'clock and, and you know what pretty much commit to 10 o'clock so that got us thinking about you know what that's when we started doing more flexible you know work hours and things like that which started with hey you can start anywhere between seven and nine and you know again you know and then that migrated to yeah people can work at home 
you know, once in a while if they want. So, you know, again, and kind of instead of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater, it was like, well, maybe we don't have to be as rigid about how we're doing things. Um, and you're building kind of, trust with your employees that they're going to deliver on outcomes. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. And I know we're we're out of time. And, and if one sentence or two, what I want to ask, what brings you the greatest joy as a leader? I think uh, the freedom to create possibilities. Um, we were able to reduce our hours from 11 to eight, close on major holidays. These are things that um, create better quality of life for people, right? So being able to create possibilities, offer opportunities, um, that is the greatest joy and seeing people grow. That's wonderful. What about you, Lou? Yeah, totally agree. I mean, seeing people succeed both within the company and, um, you know, when they, or if they leave, um, giving them kind of hopefully some foundation for them to, you know, everybody leaves for something better, which, you know, I, I don't think we can complain about that really. That's, I think that's a great end to, to the conversation. Thank you to the both of you for all this, uh, I'm going to call each of you because I have more questions. <laughs> no, but I really appreciate it. Thank you for being examples and role models of leadership. A lot of people have so much to learn from the both of you. And that's also incorporating everything you're still learning too. So thank you so much for your time today. And I'm going to pass it on to Anya. Yeah, thank you no, very much. Yeah, thank you for being here and um, have a good evening and I'll see you at the next event, everybody.